just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 343 of Science on Top. Today is Monday the 7th of September 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And this show is only possible thanks to the generous support from our Patreon subscribers. People like Kirsty Saxton and Elizabeth Gordon who have been chipping in each episode to help us pay the bills and keep the lights on. So why not join them and maybe get your name read out on a podcast at scienceontop.com slash donate. And Penny, let's begin by looking at how the French love of eating snails has led to the near extinction and then revival of tiny but culturally and scientifically important snails in French Polynesia. Yeah, we were actually just having a chat before the show about who's eaten snails and it seems like I'm the only one. Of the three of us who You are has. brave. You well, are adventurous. As I said, like there was so much garlic and butter <laughs> involved. I think I could have eaten anything and it would have t- tasted delicious. But um, this is a sort of a, a good news story, which I like to do from time to time to, you know. <laughs> Balance. Good for the psyche, <laughs> good for the planet. Um, about snail ecology in French Polynesia. So the history of French Polynesia in terms of snails was it it has these little snails called parchula snails. So they're indigenous to the islands. Um, they are really small between one and two centimetres in length. They have beautiful little spiral shells. They're ecologically important to do with, you know, breakdown of leaf litter. They eat algae and so on. But they're also culturally significant. Um, their shells are used to make necklaces and crowns and these snails being kind of like Darwin's finches of the snails of French Polynesia were different on each island. So each island has its own sort of kind of snail shell and could make its own particular special gifts to hand to others in ceremonies. So they're really important, um, you know, not just ecologically but culturally as well. However, the French came uh, last century and thought, do you know what we like? Snails. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, just <think> it. <laughs> I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> oh, apparently Pepe Le Pew is on the podcast this week. <laughs> <laughs> mm, 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 I love snails. <laughs> the poor French, they don't deserve their stereotypes. Anyway, as so often happens when European colonial powers come to somewhere else and go, oh, I really like my rabbits or my whatevers or my snails from home and introduce them, it doesn't go as well as you might hope. So they introduced giant African snails, um, which escaped and began destroying the local crops. So in order to deal with this, the idea of a biological control was used. It was a second snail, the rosy wolf snail, which would kill off the introduced African, giant African snails. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? It's (laughs) It's a genius idea. Not every biological control, (laughs) but so many biological controls. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so instead of eating the African snails, the wolf wolf snails um, chose to eat these little parchula snails. The ones we're already trying to protect. The ones we're trying to protect now. Right. Yes. So... (laughs) The African snails were destroying crops and probably out competing, but the other snails, and these wolf snails are actually really predatory snails. Like I have never thought of a predatory snail. So they're fast movers. They follow slime trails to track and kill and eat other snails. Yeah. So they're real hunters. So these rosy wolf snails actually wiped out more than half of the species. So there were originally 120 different species in Polynesia of parchula snails and half of them are actually extinct now. Um, so some individuals have been collected um, on purpose sort of in the 90s to try and preserve them. Others were already being studied at different universities. And so what has been done is that um, 
breeding populations have been established and at the same time the wolf snail populations have been dropping. It's not that there's none left, but there's not as many left anymore. So, Do we know why more than, their populations I don't are know dropping? why. I'm guessing perhaps, just, um, you know, they were introduced to this new habitat, they did mm-hmm. that population boom thing and are maybe now down to a more sustainable level. Okay, yep. Fingers crossed. So there's very not many left, so hopefully not enough to really truly kind of boom again. Mm. But um, more than 15,000 different snails have been released, um, total of different 14 species and different subspecies back onto the islands. Um, oh. It's been a whole lot of zoos and universities breeding them and it takes a long time, like years and years to breed up, you know, 2,000 snails or mm. so. So it's a lot of work and effort that has gone into this. Um, so these animals have been released back into their their homeland uh, where hopefully they'll start to breed and grow and establish themselves and, you know, take their place back in those island ecosystems once again. As you say, that's quite a lot of effort to go to. Yeah. Little one and two centimetre snails. Just little tiny little snails. sounds so insignificant. But when you take into fact that, A, there's a cultural significance to it, anyway so we need to respect that and try and help that ecosystem out but i think that darwin's finch analogy that you mentioned Mm. is really fascinating that they're on each island has just had its own the population has evolved its own little yeah yeah, traits to deal with the unique environment that they're in that's it's extraordinary and good on them for reintroducing 15 was it uh, 15,000 individuals yeah so that's a lot of snails it is. I mean, they're very small. Like, you could fit that in a few yeah, jars. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it is. Oh, very cool. And Lucas, speaking of very cool, there was a really big explosion in our galaxy uh, and in astronomically recent times, too. What do we know about the big boom three and a half million years ago? Ah, oh, yes. So this this um, was a discovery back in 2013, actually. It was a while ago that we, we found these things that are known as the Fermi bubbles, um, so-called because they were, they were uh, discovered by the uh, Fermi and uh, Rosat satellites. Um, so, the, so Fermi, um, one of the, basically the first observation of these things, indicated that there were these gamma and X-ray Um, lobes that were above and below the galactic plane of the Milky Way and it was thought that these could only have been created by our black hole, the black hole in the centre of the the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star, basically having a little hissy fit and becoming a a quasar for a short period of time or more specifically uh, emitting what's known as a Seyfert flare. Now since then, uh, in fact later that same year there was another observation um, which found that there was a hydrogen alpha emission that was also along a, a section of the Magellanic Stream, which is, think of it like a tail uh, of, of um, particles left by the, the large and small Magellanic clouds as they, as they orbit our galaxy. Mm-hmm. So there was basically something had lanced through that tail and, and left these telltale, tell, telltale signs. So... Uh, since then, uh, not a huge amount has happened about this, but there have been new um, observations by the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, evidence of two enormous bursts of, of ionising radiation that's, that's, again, has sort of gone through the, above and uh, below the plane of our galaxy, shooting out like cones as it, as it spread from the uh, Sagittarius A star, our, our supermassive black hole, and, and basically lanced out to about 200,000 light years into space above and below the, the plane of the galaxy. Um, that's, you know, we, we've seen this with other galaxies before. We've seen these, these streaming jets of ionised radiation coming off the, the you know the uh, the core uh, of, of galaxies um, and when that happens it's indication that the the black hole at the center of those galaxies is feeding 
Um, so a feeding black hole or a quasar, basically, it, it not everything goes in. It, it ends up expelling these these cores of radiation uh, these uh, along its spin axis. Um, so that's, you know, we've seen these things crossing enormous distances, and that, that appears to be what has happened. Now, what's interesting about this latest finding is that up until... Um, recently, we didn't. We, we had an idea of how long ago it was, based on the um, some factors such as the movement of the Magellanic clouds, um, and and how much drift there was of those uh, what had been detected before those different types of radiation. But the new observation has allowed us to to narrow down how long, how much, how the the period of time that it was shooting these jets out from the core oh, and okay. it appears yeah so you already mentioned in the in the intro that um it was a it was, it's already been narrowed down to around somewhere between three and five million years ago it appears to be around 3.5 million years ago that this took place and these jets that were shooting out lasted about three hundred thousand years oh um, whoa which i was yeah, expecting I mean, just to, a you know short burst every now and then sort of thing like sort of like a lighthouse kind right. of thing but 300,000 years, that's a long time. It's, a, it's yeah, I mean, to us, it's a really long time. It is. But obviously, <laughs> to, in galactic terms, it's a blink. Yeah. And we've long believed really for, well, when I say long, so it's, as long as we've been studying such a serious A and uh, A star in any case, we've been of the assumption of the opinion that our galactic core, the, the, Milky, the supermassive black hole at the, at the centre of our galaxy, is not doing much. It's just hanging around. It's being boring. It's not really feeding. Um, not much activity there. Kind of boring in the in the scheme of things. You know, if you can consider four point <laughs> five million solar masses boring, um, but you know, not not all that exciting. But you know, it's only three point five million years ago that it shot these massive cones of radiation out over three hundred thousand light years in both directions. That must have been some serious matter that was that it was chowing down on. Yeah. So there there have been some uh, various suggestions of what it could have been um, that it was chowing down on. It seems likely, um, although we we may never know for sure, but it seems likely based on what we what we can see orbiting Sagittarius A star. And by the way, that is freaking cool. If you ever get a chance to look up some of the animations of, of Sagittarius A star with that show the various other stars that are that are that are orbiting this mm. this uh, supermassive black hole, we can detect them through the gas and the the dust that's in the way using different you know uh, frequencies of light. And this is actually one of the ways that we now we we discovered this supermassive black hole was to was was watching. All of these things, these these otherwise massive, massive stars zipping around what appeared Something. to be nothing. Yeah, just yeah. I mean, they, they were just they were just flying around at, at extraordinary uh, velocities and all orbiting this this common centre of mass. And well, you know, two and two together uh, equals one point four uh, million solar masses. So, <laughs> Wait, <what? laughs> um, so, if you get a, so if you do get a chance to have a look at some of these animations, uh, do, uh, do look them up because they're very cool, but it's, it's thought that, um, there's a, a particular star that has been sort of having grazing, you know, blows or grazing bl uh, glances at, um, as it goes around the, uh, the supermassive black hole. And it's thought that this star, May well have given up some of its mass on one of those those close approaches, and that mass, of course, would have been uh, ripped from the star. Would have originally formed as an accretion disk around the black hole. Would have superheated. Um, would have would have given off a whole ton of X ray and all that sort of thing mm. due to the the heat, and then the black hole has slowly consumed it over apparently roughly three hundred thousand years as it's uh, chowed down on that mass from that particular star. So there's some other theories, you know, that could have been, um, could have even been actual, um, you know, mass, could have been things like planets that are stripped away from stars as they as they whip around the, the black hole. Could have been all sorts of things. But, um, yeah, really, really cool to think that, you know, it, realistically our black hole is a sleeping giant 
but mm. it might just be dozing. <laughs> and also, I mean, as you say, these are these flares are pointing perpendicular to uh, the angle that most of the other stars and everything are, are orbiting the, uh, the centre. Yes. They're not on the plane of elliptic. Um, but if we had been in the path, these this is ionising radiation, so we're talking cancers and all sorts of terrible things. Oh, that, yeah. That would have been... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nasty. Yeah, this wouldn't have been a pleasant yeah. uh, cone to exist in, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, not just that. It's the ionising radiation. It's X-rays. It's gamma rays. It's all of the rays that we don't like. It's our least favourite <laughs> rays. At least for, for, for our, you know, our... our tissue True. Uh, you know yeah aliens might we, have, we like the rays resistant to it. <laughs> maybe but we you know we like these rays for for helping us detect things and see things mm -hmm. but not 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 standing in the race we don't do that not for sun baking no no <laughs> unless you know we might all be well then again we might all be the hulk if you know the gamma rays so you never know <laughs> but i don't think so it's possibly not how physiology works <laughs> <laughs> you think maybe maybe not maybe marvel's I, not the best place i don't want to ruin you. comic books for people but uh yeah sometimes fiction is just fiction <laughs> okay i'll write that down well let's bring it back down to earth penny and talk about water rats and i don't mean the late 90s tv show starring colin freels Oh my god! Oh, good show. That love that show. Good uh, theme show. I can barely remember it, but yeah, okay. But this is actually a lot more interesting because it's about well, it's actually about what we were talking about earlier uh, with introduced species, which mm. don't turn out to be such a good idea. Uh, and the most notable example here in Australia, of course, is the cane toad. But it seems water rats are learning to be expert assassins here and are actually hunting them down. Which is encouraging. Yeah, it is encouraging. It's not going to um, end Australia's cane toad problem. Unless um, we introduce more water rats. <laughs> more water rats. <laughs> um, so cane toads are, you know, gradually spreading across Australia. They take more and more and they're sort of out competing and killing um, native creatures where they go and they're also not very easy to eat because they're so poisonous um so nothing well not nothing but very few animals can eat them even the ones that usually would have frogs and toads as a source of food so they're a big massive problem and but what's been found is that water rats can actually or some groups of water rats can actually eat cane toads and it's quite interesting so i mean the way that this was sort of flagged is that there was a in 2014 researchers found um a creek that was dotted with the bodies of cane toads that had been attacked and they all had the same kinds of injuries so with almost surgical precision it's been described they um removed the heart and liver and the gallbladder which has toxic bile salts was sort of moved outside the chest cavity so these toads are being eaten safely like by avoiding all the toxins um and what's interesting is the bit of infrared camera discovery found out that they were done a bit killed by um water rats so the water rats um are sort of dissecting the toads they have a preference to um go after large so toads so oh. they look for big ones, which are a better sort of source of food for them. Um, and they're one of the few mammals that actually will hunt and eat cane toads. There's a few birds that will, um, but not very many mammals. And Australia hasn't got very many sort of big mammal predators no. anyway. Um, so... What's really interesting is this seems to be a behaviour of a couple of groups of water rats. It's not every water rat will eat. Oh, wow. Cane toads. So it's sort of isolated to a little area. Yeah. But when, and it also it's interesting to think about the origin of behaviour, whether or not they've somehow really rapidly learned how to eat toads or if mm. they're adapting a strategy that they, maybe they used for native frogs that seems okay. to have worked. 
So it seems, you know, it's probably possible for other groups of rats to learn it and it might help, um, look, it's not going to end problems, but it might sort of help alleviate some cane toad issues when they get up to a waterway, which have these water rats in them. So it again, might it's, slow it, down it's, the, it uh, might slow the down rats, yeah. or it could, um, yeah, be a bit of a line of defense against cane toads. Maybe not a big one, but you know, every little bit adds up and it's interesting to see if the tactics do spread between different groups of rats because, I mean, if nothing else, I mean, it's a great source of food that no one else is yeah. really exploiting. You've got your own little ecological yeah. niche there that you niche can there, yeah. exploit. So it's only in the Kimberley, yeah, so far that this, these have been Yeah. Started. But that's the so, really amazing thing, actually. From what I read, it's just in like this five-metre stretch of mm. creek. It's such a localised event. Yeah, so, it's really like really local. So fingers crossed for the water rat's sake that they can teach other groups. So that's the, I mean, as you said, the, how, how they're actually mm. learning this is, is stunning. So apparently they, the, the mothers teach their offspring how to hunt after they wean them. So there's a, so they're passing stuff on. But can you imagine the, I, I mean, for humans, where we got to write stuff down normally to figure out. <laughs> oh, right, see, so I ate these bit. Okay, uh, okay, I'm dying. All right, right make a note. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. how do they? Are the rats then rats aren't comparing notes. It's not like they're going, ha ha. Now we know it's that bit that we don't need. You know, it, it's it's. Mm. I find that incredible that they figure yeah. that out. Unless there's some scent or something that they can they can adapt to maybe the the fact that they've got maybe they because they're rodents and they chew maybe they they kind of more attuned rather than snakes and pythons and stuff it would just grab them and just swallow them and go ah that was a mistake um but i just find that incredible well i've read that um omnivores so like rodents like humans often tend to be pretty smart about their food choices they're a bit more discerning and able to judge foods on their own merits rather than like oh, I just eat eucalyptus and eucalyptus is what I eat. You know, we have to be able to make calls about what foods are good and which bits of foods are good mm. and not. The other thing that really struck me and is the fact that it's a native species. These water mm. rats are native water rats. Mm. So at least they're not introduced, but they're not, the, as you say, they're in so localised. Yeah. Is, you know, are there, I assume there are equal dangers with, with taking some water rats from there and introducing them elsewhere because... You're still messing with, you know, unless they're areas where they've already got water rats, but it's not like they're going to sort of hold a class, take them to TAFE, <laughs> well, teach them how to do it. I mean, they've got to outcompete the other ones. So it's, yeah, I don't know it's how territorial things, they it's are. It's really or... promising. Yeah, right. but I mean, I'm sure it's... that different different groups will interbreed and yada yada. Like the tactics could spread among the population without us necessarily transplanting. Maybe show them videos. This is another water rat doing it. Um, send <laughs> them to a lecture. <laughs> uh, there was a sentence that jumped out at me, though, uh, which was when they're talking about the finding all these um, toads with these precision uh, surgical uh, wounds, the finding intrigued us enough to dissect waterlogged and rotting toad bodies in 40 degree heat. Ugh. That's not mm. an exciting job, I would imagine. That's, That's yeah, PhD you've got to student. Be, I've got something for you to do. <laughs> yeah, you've got to be certain, you know, high level intrigue there. That's that's yeah. what's required for that. Definitely. I want to know more. I, yeah. I want a follow up study. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we, we talked about some, what was it? Was it um, some particular ants were targeting cane toads from some. From memory, I think we talked about it on a previous show. I don't remember. They, you know, oh. they haven't. What are they doing? Why are they keeping <laughs> up? I know we've talked about, I think it was crows that uh, will flip the cane toad over and That's go right. for the belly. Eat their bellies. Which isn't, yeah. Isn't poisonous, but mm. I don't know. So lots of little ways that we're finding to mm. stop the problem, but uh, not enough, clearly, because right. it's a growing issue. But. That's all we've got for this show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com 343. 
Thanks to all our Patreon supporters. You're the reason we're able to do this show. So thanks to everyone who's been to scienceontop.com slash donate and signed up. And thank you, Penny and Lucas. No worries. Thanks, Ed. And a big thank you to everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. So tell us about that contrast, because I found school oppressive at times, probably because I moved a lot. But, you know, I was a curious kid. I had a great passion for learning and I did not feel that at school. Yes. Like, let's put it this way. If you were to go in your computer and you're like, hold on, how do magnets work? And you type it up, you're going to get an answer. You're going to be like, wow, this is actually really cool. You click on the next link and the next link and suddenly you're like a PhD in electromagnetism. (laughs) But if you just got taught in school and you're like, well, I want to I want to go to art class. Can we leave? It's not going to be fun because the main difference is just that school, it's driven just by the facts, just by the knowledge. You know, you're being taught this so you can know what it is and you can understand. But just what I found from Ty Why that was so much better is that I was learning science, but it was driven by curiosity. Mm. What school does It doesn't cater to the fact that you're curious about something. It just gives you that information, whether or not it's what you want to hear, what you don't want to hear but would end up liking, or you just don't want to hear at all. It just gives you the information, and it, like, kind of kills curiosity. It's just, it's there to give you the information because that's how a curriculum works. But it's not there to answer your questions or do any of that, and you really feel that, and that kind of ties into the whole oppressive thing. Do you reckon that's a complete and utter tragedy of modern education, though? That one statement that you make, that school kills curiosity. I mean, what a disastrous situation that we found ourselves in, if that's the the reality of education today. Unfortunately, it's not great. You know, we're just kind of taught in the style of the industrial age. You learn how to do something, you grow up, you do it, you die. You don't do it, you get punished. You do do it. You get to work some more and then eventually you die. 